طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم مساء الخير الجمعه مبروك عليكم مرحبا بكم في جلسه جديده من جلسات مجموعه الباحثين السودانيين اليوم الجمعه 24 يونيو 2022 يسعدنا ويشرفنا انه يكون عندنا سيمينار اليوم مميز جدا بعنوان استكشاف تاريخ مجموعه من الحقبه المسيحيه من كولون بارتي باستخدام استخدام الحمض النووي القديم المقدم دكتور كاندرا ان سراك عالمه بارزه في قسم ابحاث الحمض النووي القديم بقياده بروفيسور ديفيد رايخ من كليه الطب بجامعه هارفارد والمستضيفه بتاعت الويبينار ان شاء الله دكتوره هبه بابكر العالمه البارزه برضو في نفس المجال وخريجه محد ماكس بلانك. So good evening everyone. Uh, I'm Anwar Daballa, uh, the founder of the Sudanese Research Foundation. I'm very delighted to have Dr. Kendra today uh, in this webinar titled Exploring the History of a Christian Period Group from Columbarity Using Ancient DNA. Uh, Dr. Kendra Hirak uh, is with the Harvard Medical School, Department of Genetics, uh, Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Hiba Babikir will be the host of this webinar. And uh, just to give you a little bit of information about the Sudanese researchers, the Sudanese researchers is a nonprofit organization uh, founded in 2009 by a small group of graduate students abroad. Uh, the group grown to have more than 700,000 members on Facebook. The foundation provides uh, increased access to partnership aimed at improving the national science and technology platform for local community. Uh, we help build capacities for the students and young researchers. So thank you, Dr. Kendra, for uh, being here. And Dr. Hiva, it's up to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anwar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. With great pleasure and on behalf of the Sudanese Researchers Foundation, I would like to welcome our featured guest speaker, Dr. Kendra Ann Sirak, who delightedly accepted our invitation to join us today and share her interesting research outcomes. Um, Dr. Kendra Sirak, as Anwar already um, um, explained, is a senior staff scientist um, in the ancient DNA group of Dr. David Reich at Harvard Medical School and Harvard University, where they analyze genome-wide ancient DNA data, while also focusing on the ethics and broader impact of such work. She is interested in learning how we can best leverage the study of ancient human genomes to provide new information uh, to living people, some of whom may have biological or cultural legacies uh, to the ancient indiv individuals um, that are studied. She mainly uh, conducts research in Northeast Africa, where she looks to better understand the movements and interactions of people throughout Africa and between continents using ancient DNA. So Dr. Kirak is also a National Geographic explorer and her current project explores the genetic origins and affinities of later Stone Age people from the Northern Sahel. Dr. Sirak obtained her Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and Psychology from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, and a, deg and a degree in Human Osteology from Loyola uh, University of Chicago. She obtained her master's degree in physical and biological anthropology from Emory University and also her doctor of philosophy in physical and biological anthropology from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. So her dissertation work explored the genetics, um, the genetic ancestry of Christian period uh, people from the site of Kulubnarti in Sudanese Nubia and investigated a long standing question about the genetic relationships among people buried in two neighboring cemeteries at the site who showed skeletal uh, evidence of differences in morbidity and mortality. That broadly suggestive of differences in social status. She will talk more about, uh, about uh, the project and um, the research outcomes. What is also interesting about the Crossirac work is that she also focused on how the, um, to most responsibly study the human skeleton for ancient DNA research. This included collaborating on the identification of the most DNA rich part of the human skeleton and developing techniques for accessing this skeletal element. Um, I know that as better as bone. And that is a, uh, they tried to do a minimally invasive way. So she led the, the, the training of researchers around the globe in the use of the minimally invasive techniques and continues to do so today. 
Uh, we think that Dr. Sirak's work is significant to understanding our history. As we, like Sudanese, uh, like we represent part of the answer to the question who we are and how we got here. This is a very big question in evolutionary biology and in human genomics in general that we, we would like to answer this question. And there are many different pieces that we would like to, to, to bring together to, to, to be able to answer this question. So also modern and ancient DNA studies from Sudan, considering its geographical location and its linguistic and cultural and genetic diversity contribute to revealing the continent's past and outlining the details of the outer Africa hypothesis. So the Dr. Sirak, the stage is yours, and we are very excited to hear more from you about the work in preliminary. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Babaker, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm very excited to talk about this. Um, so I'll jump right in. Um, so first, it's nice to situate ourselves. So let's get started by talking about what we know about Nubia and then the site of Kulubnardi. So here's this land that we refer to in this work as Nubia, um, it's located along the Nile, spanning between the first cataract around Aswan to the sixth cataract um, near Khartoum. Um, and it's just completely bisected from north to south by the Nile River. And this region of the world has long served as a corridor for the movement of people and the exchange of culture and goods and genes between uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Egypt, and then further afield into West Eurasia as well. So the site I'm going to be discussing today is Kul of Nardi, and it's located about 130 kilometers south of the border between Egypt and Sudan, and it's shown on this map by a yellow diamond. So this region um, in which Kul of Nardi is found is called, called the Batan al-Hajar, translated as belly of rocks, um, a super barren and forbidding environment with no continuous floodplain and only small pockets of alluvial land that historically supported relatively small populations. So Kulubnardi, as you see here from a Google Maps image, um, is translated as Isle of Kulb. It's actually only a true Nile at the peak, uh, a true island at the peak of the Nile flood. Okay, so in 1979, two cemeteries situated around one kilometer apart were excavated at Kulubnardi. Um, I was not part of this excavation. I was not even born at this time, um, but my advisor in graduate school was the head of the excavation here. And these cemeteries were excavated as part of the UNESCO funded movement to save the monuments of Nubia. And this is just because of the construction and enlargement of the High Aswan Dam. Um, many of the most important sites along the Nile were going to be flooded and that flooding was going to be permanent. And so sites had to be excavated very quickly. Um, so archaeologists really raced to save as much of the most important heritage material and remains from these sites as possible before they were underwater. So from these two cemeteries, one of them, 21S46, or what we'll call the S Cemetery, is located on the island of Kub. And the other one is on the adjacent West Bank, and that's 21R2, or we'll just call it the R Cemetery here. Now, there's been a really long standing question since the 70s when these cemeteries were excavated. Um, and that has been whether they're contemporaneous. So, were the people living and using these cemeteries at the same time? And now, while the graves from the R Cemetery and S Cemetery exhibited no typological distinction, um, so they both had a high frequency of slot graves, single burials that were wrapped in shrouds and limited grave goods, um, an analysis of pottery within the graves and the architectural association of the grave superstructures suggested that the cemetery on the island, the S Cemetery, was in use between the early Christian period um, and that the R Cemetery came into use later um, around the classic to terminal Christian period. Um, however, when they analyzed the textiles in the graves, they found that there were similarities and they both exhibited characteristics of the early Christian period. So this is a question that we can examine with biomolecular data and specifically by looking at radiocarbon data. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so archaeological and bioarchaeological analyses were carried out of these remains from their um, moment of excavation in 1979 up until the present day. And what they suggested was that Kulubnardi was home to a single 
biologically related and culturally homogenous population that was divided into two socially distinct cemetery communities. That's what people understood from looking at the remains themselves. So what evidence do we have to talk to support this? So let's talk about biological relatedness. Um, how people determined that was that they found no significant differences using discrete dental traits, cranial non-metric traits, or craniometric traits. So they are very similar biologically. Um, there's no significant morphological differences between these two cemetery communities. Now, how about culture related, uh, culturally homogenous? What does that mean? Well, what we found here was that there's no difference in grave orientation, grave type, head or body positioning, and there's a lack of grave goods in both cemeteries. So basically, people were buried in very similar ways in both cemeteries. And furthermore, there is no isotopically measurable differences in diet. And here you can see from the isotope study, it looks like those people were eating the exact same things. So culturally homogenous. Now, how about socially distinct? Why are we interpreting that? So despite these similarities in biology and culture, the cemeteries appear to be in a way socially stratified. So specifically, studies of stress-induced lesions, patterns of growth and development, and the average life expectancy suggested that the people who were buried in the S cemetery were exposed to more stress, experienced more ill health, and died much younger than those who were buried in the R cemetery. So for example, you can see here that the average age at death in the S cemetery is just over 10 years. And in the R cemetery, it's over 19 years. So, so very young ages at death on average for both cemeteries, but a lot younger for this island cemetery. Okay, so in a 1999 monograph on the site, um, Bill Adams, who is a uh, famous archaeologist in Sudan, um, and his group write about Kulabnardi. The combination of cultural and biological evidence from Kulabnardi suggests a wholly unexpected possibility that this region in early Christian times was home to two biologically and culturally indistinguishable but socially distinct communities, one of which was considerably better off than the other. And then they say, for the moment, there is no obvious explanation for this anomaly. So interesting. Now, their hypothesis was that um, there was a sort of social relationship where small groups of impoverished, landless, semi-nomadic people um, who were ethnically Nubian acted as sharecroppers or seasonal laborers for land-owning families. Um, and it's been proposed that this social structure could have existed in Christian times and that the people who were buried in the S Cemetery um, provided this, this kind of uh, service, this labor for people who were landowners who were then buried in the R Cemetery upon their death. Um, now, what we wanted to do in our work, and this is part of my dissertation, um, was to use ancient DNA to investigate the question of the relationship between these cemeteries, as well as broader questions too. So we have two main research aims. The first one is to investigate the genetic landscape of the Nile Valley before the influence of those Islamic migrations that began in the late first millennium CE and really changed the biology and the culture of um, Sudan. And second, we wanted to address a very specific question. And this was about the relationship among the people buried in these two cemeteries in light of our knowledge that they have differences in morbidity and mortality that are broadly suggestive of social status. So this is really bringing together archaeology and bioarchaeology with DNA too. DNA on its own here would not be so strong, but combining it with archaeology um, really gave us some solid hypotheses to test. So let's talk a little bit about what is ancient DNA at a very basic level. What it is, simply, is a study of DNA collected from biological specimens. In our case, it's human remains, but this can also be animals or plant remains. So anything that has lived thousands of years ago to hundreds of years ago to hundreds of thousands of years ago. So a wide range of time, but basically um, organisms that lived in the past. And I like to talk about we go from bones to base pairs. So we take bone material or other biological material, and we extract base pairs from it, which is our DNA sequence. 
So why do we study this? What's the point of this whole thing? Um, ancient DNA is a great tool for looking at the genomes of people who lived in a specific place at a known time in the past. So just like we think of a microscope, allowing us to look at a world of microbes that you actually just can't see with your naked eye, ancient DNA acts as a, a little bit of a window or a microscope into the past. And it allows us to study the variation in organisms that lived a long time ago. So it really enables us to investigate how people in the past are connected to each other and how they're similar or different to people living in the same place today. So this is really important in a place that has undergone biological uh, transitions over time. For example, from the Islamic migrations, which mean that people who live in this part of the world today might not be the same as people who live there prior to these movements. And the human skeleton is simply an amazing source of information. So I can answer things like, where in the world did my ancestors live? Were my mother and father from the same place or from different places? What other ancient or modern people are most genetically similar to me? And do they still live in the same area today where I might have lived generations ago? Um, and also you can explore things like what traits might I have had, like disease resistance, sensitive to bitter tastes, um, things like lactase persistence, malaria resistance, these interesting questions we can explore using uh, DNA. So what we did in this project was we screened 111 individuals from Kulavnardi. They had been excavated and, pro and after their excavation, they were exported to the collections of um, uh, um, a skeletal material at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And they were curated there in a lab. Um, they're no longer there. They're, they're at Arizona State now, but that's where they were when I studied them. Um, and so we screened 111 individuals for evidence of authentic DNA, and we enriched promising libraries for sequences overlapping 1.24 million genome-wide SNPs. Now, that sentence probably sounds like I'm speaking a totally different language, so I'll break this down just a little bit um, to talk about some of the most important steps of this process. So the picture that you see here is how our workflow proceeded. So what you can see is we sample a piece of bone, we extract the DNA from the bone using a watery substance, we take the DNA molecules and we treat them, which is what we call preparing sequencing libraries. And this just means that we enable them to become readable from the DNA by the DNA machine. We take the important pieces of DNA and we sequence them. So I'm gonna talk about the first step of this and the last step of this in just a little bit more detail. So first, sampling the piece of bone. Um, what do we know about bone and DNA? So we know that dense bone, which is cortical bone, preserves DNA better than spongy bone, which is trabecular bone. And for a few years, people just used any sort of dense cortical bone for DNA. So for example, from the shaft of the long bone, people would use that for DNA. This gave results that were okay, but they weren't great. Now, a few years ago, um, 2014, we had a great revelation. And that was that the petrous part of the temporal bone, which you can see here, preserves endogenous DNA better than any other skeletal element. And what endogenous DNA is, is it's DNA from the individual that you want to study. And this is compared to contaminant DNA, which is from other individuals or from the environment. And that's what we don't want to study. So when we look at this kind of um, result, we see that the petrous bone gives better DNA preservation in the same individual than other bones. So here, for example, for this individual any one, you can see that the petrous bone gives much more DNA than from a bone sample uh, taken from a, the finger here. This is the metacarpal, so a finger bone. Um, and so that's, that's a really important finding. And this is especially important in a region of the world like Sudan, where the hot climate negatively impacts DNA preservation. One really important thing is that hot and dry areas of the world preserve DNA much worse than uh, temperate areas or cold areas. That's why there's a lot of DNA research done in Russia, in, in the colder areas of the world, and a lot less done in low latitude areas. So, okay, we have this petrous bone. I'm gonna show it to you here. 
And um, it's the part of your bone, of your, of your skull, that houses the components of the inner ear. And you'll see why I'm talking about this in a second. So it looks like this, it's, com it's a pyramid shape and it's composed of a base apex, three surfaces and three angles. Now you can feel it right on the side of your head. And also it has an endocranial part. So if you cut open a skull, you'd be able to see it from the top and it has, part it forms part of the skull base. So you could see it from the, the bottom of the skull too. And here's just a really good image, I think, of showing how the, the temporal bone and the petrous portion of the temporal bone is situated in your skull. Now, um, what is even more important for this is that the petrous isn't the same in DNA preservation throughout. Instead, there's a certain little part of it that preserves DNA the best. And that is called the osseous labyrinth and specifically the cochlea. Now, this is the part of your um, body that helps you balance and hear, and it's orange in this image. And you can see here that it preserves DNA up to 65 fold better than the bone that surrounds it, and up to 177 fold better than the bone at the tip of the petrus, which is called the apex of the petrus. And why is that? So this is because it undergoes a unique developmental process where it completes its ossification, it becomes, it completes its growth, and it doesn't undergo remodeling after six months in utero. So you are born with a full-sized cochlea, um, say, and, it, and it's the same size in an adult as in a newborn. Um, also, it has some unique histological properties. So it experiences a near absence of growth, modeling, and remodeling throughout life. So having this finding really actually is, I think, the key that allowed us to carry out this DNA study. So how do we work on this? Um, these are actual pictures of me um, working on a bone on, during my PhD. So this is the S2 individual from one of the cemeteries, from the S cemetery here. This is the petrous bone. And what we do is we clean the surface of the sample, we isolate the cochlea, we clean it from any sediment, we decontaminate it by exposing it to UV light, and then we grind it into a fine powder. This all takes place in an ancient DNA clean room, which is a room that is sterile and it is protected from any sort of environmental um, impact so that we can just study DNA in it, um, ancient DNA, without having any sort of worry about contamination. So we screened 111 individuals and we obtained what we call genome-wide data for 66 of them. Now we had 27 successes from the R cemetery and 39 from the S cemetery. So it looks like the people who were buried on the island had a little bit more preserved DNA than the people who were buried on the mainland. Um, now the second piece of this puzzle I wanna talk about is um, what, what we actually studied in this work. And what these were are what we call SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. So humans, one human and another human are 99%, 99.9% genetically similar to each other. But there are about 0.1% of our genome where we differ. So here, this red person has an A in this position and this green person has a G in this position. So this single point of difference is what we call a SNP. And we study 1.24 million of them. And why we do this is because your genome compiles information from hundreds to thousands of your ancestors. So you could see right here how quickly the number of ancestors you have increases as you go back generations. So around 20 of uh, 20 some generations back, you have over 1 million ancestors. That's amazing. Now you don't have DNA from all of those 1 million ancestors, but you definitely have it from a couple hundred to maybe a thousand ancestors. So by studying the full genome of one individual, we're actually studying genomic information from hundreds to thousands of that individual's ancestors. And this is a little different to archeology span where when you study one individual, you're really only studying that one individual. And that's what makes this genome-wide data so powerful. Now, um, I told you I would talk a little bit more about radiocarbon dating. So to get at that question of whether our cemeteries were contemporaneous, whether they were in use at the same times, we directly radiocarbon dated 29 individuals. And what we found 
was that the cemeteries were in use contemporaneously. So in this plot here, you can see the start date and the end date, as well as the duration of use of each cemetery. And what's important is that they overlap. Um, there are some slight, you know, a little slight difference here and there, but um, the majority of the numbers overlap quite well. So we can determine that these cemeteries were in use between 650 and 1000 um, CE. All right, so let's talk about some results. Um, I have four key results for you. So the first result is that all the individuals from Kulab Nardi were admixed with varying amounts of Nilotic and West Eurasian related ancestry. Now, a caveat before I start to talk about this, we call it West Eurasian related ancestry because this is ancestry that isn't present um, in, it, it did not originate in Sub-Saharan Africa. It originated outside of Sub-Saharan Africa. We don't actually know right now whether it originated in Northern Africa or in West Eurasia. And we don't have any really good proxy populations yet that we've studied from Northern Africa or North of the Sahara Desert to be able to place it in Africa. So we just refer to it as broadly West Eurasian ancestry, but basically all that means is that we don't really know where it originated, but it definitely wasn't in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we use what's called principal component analysis to illustrate how the individuals from the two Kulibnardi cemeteries relate to ancient and present day people and to each other. So you can see here, there's this big genetic line, right? Um, and down here are Nilotic, uh, Sudanese, and Ethiopian um, groups, and up here are West Eurasian groups. And Kulibnardi is right along this line in a kind of spread out line here. And they overlap with present day Sudanese Arab, Beja, Nubian groups. Um, now, they also fall a little bit spread out from each other along this line. And here I can zoom in to it a little bit more. And you can see that um, we have a little bit of, of, of separation here. So what we do is we perform this statistic. It's called an F3 statistic. And we want to see if um, these individuals are admixed, whether they have ancestry from both a Nilotic source and a West Eurasian source. So do they have both ancestry from over here and over here? And if we set up the statistic and we find out that it's negative, that means that yes, this group is intermediate between this group and this group. And we do find that that's true for the case. So we can check the box that these individuals definitely have ancestry from both sources. Doesn't mean that each individual had one parent who had one ancestry and another parent who had another ancestry. This mixture could have happened very deep in time. And we'll learn a little bit more about that going forward. Okay. So we wanted to know whether any individuals were genetic outliers or was everybody pretty genetically similar? So what we did is we looked at a statistic to see if anyone had a significant amount of one type of ancestry or another type of ancestry. And what we find here is that one individual had a significantly greater amount of West Eurasian related ancestry and five individuals had a significantly greater amount of Nilotic related ancestry. And you can see that of these individuals who had excess Nilotic related ancestry, we had three from the R cemetery and two from the S cemetery. So it's not really clear that the cemeteries were genetically shifted towards one type of ancestry or another. Okay. So what we wanted to do then was understand how much Nilotic related ancestry and how much West Eurasian related ancestry we had at Kulab Nardi. So we applied this framework, it's called QPADM. And what it does, it enables us to model the ancestry of a target population here, Kulab Nardi, as a mixture of West Eurasians and Sub-Saharan Africans. And it helps us to differentiate between the sources of ancestry too. So we used 21 different possible populations to see who contributed West Eurasian related ancestry to the Kulab Narni Nubians. Now, what we found was that the best fitting model used ancient Egyptians. Um, now, this fits really well with what we know archeologically. There were millennia of interaction between Sudan and Egypt Sometimes it was friendly interaction, sometimes it wasn't friendly interaction. There was Sudanese people pushing northward, Egyptian people pushing southward, clashing in the middle, all different types of interactions over time. 
And what we found is that Coulinardi Nubians had about 60%, 60.4% Western related ancestry that was contributed to that gene pool from Egypt. Now, what doesn't work here is that Egypt is in Africa. So it's not really a place in West Eurasia that um, could ultimately be the originating place of this ancestry. So I had to take them out of the model. After doing that and rerunning this model, what I found out is that the best fitting model uses Bronze Age and Iron Age Levantine populations as a source for the West Eurasian related ancestry at Kulibnardi. And we estimate that they had about 57.5% of ancestry that was contributed to the gene pool associated with the Levant Bronze and Iron Age. And that makes sense given what we know about the geography of the Levant and the deep connections between Egypt and the Levant and then down the Nile Valley as well. So what likely happened was that there were a lot of biological connections between the Levant and Egypt and those connections came down the Nile carried by Egyptians. That's a very parsimonious explanation for what we see here. Now, the rest of this ancestry in the Kulubnardi population was contributed by Sub-Saharan Africans. So we actually think that it's probably most like a Dinka-like ancestry here. So a very deep, very ancient, melodic related ancestry. Um, so getting at that specific question, we find no evidence that people buried in the S cemetery were any different than people buried in the R cemetery. It's a really interesting finding for me as an anthropologist. Um, what we find here, and what I'm showing you on this heat plot, is 33 pairs of relatives, um, or 33 individuals that share 28 genetic relationships. So these are these are siblings, or or parent and offspring, or cousins, or second cousins, etc. Now, what's really important here is that seven of these pairs had one individual buried in the R cemetery and one individual buried in the S cemetery. So it wasn't a consistent caste-like structure. And this is more consistent with a scenario of fluidity between cemetery groups and not a caste-like system of social division that would extend intergenerationally and would mean that someone born into one family was always buried in one place or another. So there were definitely instances where people who were second degree relatives had one individual buried in one cemetery and another in the other cemetery. Um, okay, so we did a lot of statistical tests to look for genetic differences. And I'm going to skim over this part because it's just a lot of statistics. But basically, what everything here says is that the individuals in the R cemetery and the individuals in the S cemetery are not significantly genetically different from each other. They are genetically a single population and can be treated as such. Now, our third finding was that the admixture events that contributed to the gene pool at Clonardi occurred continuously over the period of around a millennium. And this is exactly what you would expect for a place that was very connected, um, like, like any place along the Nile would be. So what we see here is that we can estimate the average timing of admixture to have occurred um, around 22.2 generations or about 620 years before the studied individuals lived. So here's our period that we're studying Christian style burials at Kulibnardi, and around 620 years earlier is when the admixture on average occurred, and that's right in here. But when we examine individuals and we average and we look at their individual dates, we find a lot of variation, and we find that multiple waves of admixture over around a millennium contributed to the formation of this gene pool. So you could see that some individuals had very late admixture, almost at the time of Christian um, style burials, and some had much earlier dates. And what's important is that some of these do not overlap. So there's no way, even with a 95% confidence interval, which is what these gray bars indicate, where the um, colored point is a point estimate, so sometimes even the 95% confidence intervals didn't interlap. So we know that there was multiple waves of ongoing admixture among people who had different types of ancestry. 
Okay, and our final finding was that West Eurasian related ancestry at Kulibnardi was disproportionately associated with females. Um, so a lot of people studying archaeology have this idea of males moving around and conquering and being, you know, the people who 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 sh who sh share their ancestry around the world. But here, actually, um, we look at a comparison between the autosomes and the sex chromosomes. So we use this method because um, male and female demographic histories can be explored separately. And this is because females have two X chromosomes, males have one. So females actually have two thirds of the X chromosomes in any population, but only half of the autosomes because males and females have the same number of autosomes. So what we can do is look at ancestry proportion on the autosomes or the non-sex chromosomes, and then look at ancestry proportions on the Y chromosome, and or sorry, on the X chromosome. And we can see if these proportions are similar or different. So what we see here is that for both cemeteries, there's a lot less um, West Eurasian related ancestry in the autosomes than there is in the X chromosome. So we can see that this ancestry was being disproportionately contributed to the gene pool by females. And that's an important finding. Um, to me, this highlights the uh, importance of female mobility. It also suggests that Kulubnardi could have been a patrilocal society where males who were born in the area stayed in the area and females might have come in from elsewhere. But this is just kind of speculative. Um, it's what you can interpret from the genetic data, but it doesn't necessarily, um, that kind of interpretation would need to be supported by other lines of evidence like archaeology or oral history or other sorts of evidence. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about accessing this research because this is really important. Um, as uh, as Anwar mentioned, um, we want to enable researchers to use these data, um, understand this research, and grow it as well. So an important part of this is that this publication is open access, so it's available to everybody. You do not have to pay for it. No one should ever make you pay for it. Um, and it's available in the journal Nature Communications, as well as on the lab website. Um, and you can download it right there. Um, the data, the raw data that we analyze here and we talk about is also available. And if you want to download those data yourself, you are able to do so. You can download on the Reich Lab website, um, and here's the link here. And then also on the European Nucleotide Archive, which is a bio repository for all ancient DNA data. And you can take these exact data that I studied here and carry out any analyses um, that you, you want on them as well. Um, this is a really important part of um, doing research in any part of the world. Um, so please email me if there is any chance that you want the data but are having issues getting it or if you want the paper and are having any problems getting it. Um, I can always also share it as a PDF. I'm happy to share this research. I want people to read it and use it. Um, our next steps here will be to, as much as possible, attempt to understand the Nile Valley in a larger sense. So in different times and in different space as well. So we have one great data point here, and that's Kulibnardi. We understand what the genetic makeup of the people who lived at one point in time at Kulibnardi looked at. This doesn't mean that we can extrapolate to all Sudanese people across time or in the past or to the present. This means that we know what people living at one place at one point in time looked like genetically. And we can begin to maybe understand why this occurred. Now, the next steps of this research program will be to move up and down the Nile and see how they, uh, how people are different genetically, if they are different genetically, and then to look deeper in time and more recently in time and see how people might or might not have changed over time. So this is one great point. It's a good starting point, um, but we'll do a lot of future work to begin to make this into something that's um, more applicable um, and more, um, and speaks to a larger genetic landscape. Okay, so with that, I wanna thank everybody. There's a lot of important people who were involved in this work um, from many different walks of my life. 
And also I want to acknowledge the ancient people who we studied, they are not able to give permission for this work themselves. Um, so we depended on people who were able to um, give permission on their behalf. And that was um, people who are what is now the NCAM in Sudan, who permitted the analysis, who permitted the export. Um, and I'm very appreciative of them for being so supportive of the scientific work as far back as the 1970s and into the present day where they're still um, on board with our work. Um, but acknowledging the people who we study who don't have a voice to consent to this is very important to me here. I'm very grateful for that. And then also to everybody else who um, contributed. I get to talk about it, but this was a big team effort. Um, so that's everything. And I'll be happy to take as many questions as you have. Um, thank you, Kendra. I think before we go to questions, I thought maybe we can um, have the slide of the, uh, the the four major results, so we can probably try to translate them in Arabic Absolutely. simply to make sure. to, ma to make you know the take home message very clear. That is a great idea. Let me back up here. Um, let me go forward here. Okay, let me go forward no to problem. the end. I think they're at the end. Sorry about that. Yeah. I got a little point, yeah. I got a little excited and I went too far back. Um, okay, there you go. Those are the four key results. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn to Arabic to make sure that you know people got the message. So, um, um, Kendra, the last slide, the four results are from the research of the research of Kubernetes. أم أنا هختصر أو هلخص الأربع نقاط الرئيسية دي بإنه وجدوا كل العينات اللي تم فحصها من كلوبنارتي إنها الجينوم بتاع مختلط أو التركيبة الجينية بتاعتها مختلطة والتنوع ده ذاته مختلف يعني المكون ذاته بتاع الجينوم اختلاف ذاته مختلف لأنه في بعض العينات كانت المكون النيلي اللي هو من النيلوتيك النيلي أكبر من الـ West Euro Asian اللي هي المكون الجاي من خارج أفريقيا ممكن نقول من منطقة الميدل إيست أو منطقة منطقة الشرق الأوسط خلينا نقول عموما أو منطقة غرب غرب آسيا منطقة غرب آسيا أو غرب آسيا أوروبا يعني المنطقة بتاعت بين آسيا أوروبا دي دي, دي المنطقة اللي حصل منها الهجرة العكسية لأفريقيا ومنا المكون الموجود كان في كلوبنارتي مختلط بين المكون النيل والمكون الجاي من منطقة غرب آسيا وأوروبا برضو لقوا دليل على إنه الأشخاص اللي دفنوا في في السيمتر اللي هي مسمية في في البحث الآثاري بس إنه هما يعني ما لقوا أي اختلاف بينه وبين الأشخاص اللي دفنوا في في المقبرة الثانية اللي هي مسمية آر يعني ما في اختلاف جيني بينهم الاثنين فدي برضه نقطة يعني كانت مفاجأة أعتقد حتى للريسيرش نفسهم لأنهم اجتماعيا كانوا مختلفين طيب النقطة الثالثة اللي هي إنه ال 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 الاختلاط الجيني الموجود أو الأحداث اللي أدت للاختلاط الجيني ده ساهمت في إنه في التركيب بتاع ال ال المكون الجيني بتاع كلوبنارتي والحاجة دي حصلت خلال فترة طويلة جدا اللي هو ميلينيوم كامل يعني ألف سنة كاملة حصل فيه التركيبة بتاعت الجينات دي يعني الهجرات الانتراكشن ذو التفاعلات اللي حصلت في المنطقة دي كانت نتيجة سنوات طويلة جدا قلنا ألف سنة كاملة يعني هي تم فيها المكون ده فما حاجة حصلت بين يوم وليلة ما حاجة كانت مفاجأة كده إنه الليلة الناس تحول يقول إنه عندهم مكون نير ومكون كده لا الحاجة دي طلعت على فترات كثيرة النقطة الرابعة هي برضو مرتبطة بالنقطة اللي قبلها هي إنه الهجرات العكسية جات من خارج أفريقيا على قد بالمكون في كونو نارتي إنه كانت مرتبطة بهجرة نسائية أكبر يعني ده من خلال النتيجة الجينية اللي جوا حتى كندرا وضحت في إنه إحنا محتاجين لبرضو لبحث آثاري أو بحث يعني ما شرط يكون كتابي لكن من خلال ال ال اللي هو الأورال هيست اللي هو بسموه التاريخ الشفوي اللي تنقل من عبر الأجيال وإنه نأكد إنه فعلاً لأنه إحنا أصلاً لما لما نفكر بصورة بسيطة بنفكر إنه الرجال هم اللي كانوا بيهاجروا بسبب التجارة أو بسبب الغزوات أو غيره لكن بالعكس المكون النساء طلع في المنطقة دي أكبر حتى من خلال ما يتكون دير الدين اللي هو بيجي عن طريق النساء دي كلها كانت دلائل على إنه كان في هجرة للنساء تم في 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 الفترة دي فعدين نقاط بصورة واضحة إذا في أي أسئلة أتمنى يتم كتابتها أو ما أعرف إذا حنقدر نسمح لبعض المشاركين معنا في الزوم إنهم يطرحوا أسئلتهم مباشرة. Okay, I'm done now. I think I clarified the four points. 
and we 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 can wait for some seconds to to hear if people have any questions. I got questions here myself from from some people. So so uh, I, I think I'll go. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Kendra, for the interesting presentation. I'm not a historian or archaeologist, but I'm interested in uh, in knowing, you know, the history of uh, the region. Mm. Uh, there is a famous saying uh, that I've heard of uh, someone who is interested in ancient ancient uh, history. He said that uh, everyone has two homes: the the country that he or she belongs to right now and Sudan. So the claim is Sudan is the origin of humanity. Uh, do you find that like, you know, makes sense? I think we don't know that for certain yet, but I do think we have a lot of lines of evidence that point to Eastern Africa. Now I would say probably more slightly, uh, maybe a little bit more Southeastern um, than Sudan. But I'm I'm a big fan of having Sudan, you know, ancestry. So that's fine. Um, but I I think that um, a lot of lines of evidence are pointing towards Eastern Africa as as the homeland of people. Um, there was a study that came out maybe a, a year or two ago that that tried to posit South Africa as the ancestral home of most people. And that, that and I think that that was easily quite torn down by some of the genetic data. Um, now the the reason that you know, we can come back and kind of say this is because there is more genetic diversity in um, among among neighboring African groups than there is in the entire rest of the world. And that's how we know that this is where humans started, because this is where the greatest amount of of diversity exists is across Africa. And especially in places like Sudan, in places like Ethiopia, we see these high amounts of diversity between people who are living in, you know, not a huge amount of space, but they're just very genetically diverse. So we know that there's a very, very, very deep history of humanity here, and that only a subset of those people ever left Africa, while the rest of them stayed there and changed and formed populations and drifted uh, genetically over time. Um, so yes, I think that we're gonna be looking for that answer um, in the uh, next upcoming years. And we're also gonna be looking for things like um, what route might people have taken out of Africa? Was it a more Southern route or, or was it up the Nile and in through the Levant too? And that's something that's still being studied with genetic data as well as with other data. You know, archeologists are contributing to that a lot. Um, and we're, we're, we're learning about it in a really, really exciting time to explore this. Thank you, Anwar, for the question. I also noted this question here because I usually, when we talk about, you know, uh, DNA in Sudan, people usually ask this question. Like, uh, I, I think every time I gave a talk or listen to similar talks, people usually ask this question that um, has DNA already found, you know, out that uh, Sudan is the cradle of humanity? And I, I, I usually say that we don't have enough data yet to confirm yeah. this, this, you know, this hypothesis and it's still like we need so long time to, to reach that point where we could say like you know the cradle is it, it was at this point so yeah it's it's a very um i think complicated question that is not going to be answered from one study even with this large number of samples Absolutely. that is just typed and yeah what a fascinating project i think um i have got a question here maybe it's a more technical um how did you deal with the contamination issues i'm aware of this but you can generally give like a small kind of or a simple answer answer to to the you know to that question sure contamination is a huge issue in ancient dna sometimes we only get less than one percent of human dna in any sort of sample so there's a lot of different steps that we could take to mitigate that um the first is to do as much work as possible in this sterile clean room environment that really helps protect the DNA that you want to study from contamination. So for example, you would never be able to um, extract ancient DNA in a lab facility where you also extracted modern DNA. That would 100% cause contamination. Um, the methods that we use, the protocols that we use, which are reported in the paper, and if you have any questions on them, anyone can ask me, they're designed for ancient DNA molecules. And that is short damaged 
um, you know, relatively degraded molecules. Mm -hmm. um, so that also helps deal with contamination. The third step is when we have sequencing data, what we do is we look for the patterns of damage. We expect to see some damage mm -hmm. and we expect it to look very characteristic. Um, so if a sample has data that doesn't look damaged, it's probably not ancient, it's probably contamination. Um, and so we are able to check on that. And then you also just do some kind of sanity checks. Um, you know, we know that these people were living at this time in this place. And if we saw ancestry from somewhere that was just totally out of the realm of possibility, like say we saw some, you know, uh, Native American ancestry, we know that's just not the case. So we would know at that point that that was contamination. So you also look at everything kind of just critically as a researcher and you ask yourself, does this make sense? And if it doesn't, there are some technical things that you can do to dig in. For example, you can analyze only the damaged molecules and you could see if that looks the same as your whole data set combined. And that kind of gives you an insight into whether you're getting legitimate results or whether you're studying contamination. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I have two questions here. They are very related, but I'm going to, you know, kind of try to combine them. Sure. So um, do you think this project like is the beginning to you know, uh, producing more data from Sudan because you also mentioned at the end of your talk that you you, you know the plan is to um, you know expand the, the research across the Nile Valley and this is really interesting to to also hear about and um, like um, the question is how how you're gonna deal with you know considering curation of materials not in Sudan like outside mostly in inter international museums and yeah. you know. And how do you foresee the collaborations with local authorities like, you know, Sudanese uh, museum and universities and, and, and also second, like for these plans in terms of ancient DNA preservation and the climate driven challenges uh, to successfully not only extract DNA to, to sequence as just mentioned in the, in the damage question or the contamination question. So. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with the first part, which is expanding this project. So there's a couple ways that we would like to do that. Um, what we've done so far is I've worked with researchers who are have both long term presence working in Sudan and who are Sudanese themselves um, to write things like National Geographic grants to fund work at other archaeological sites or on other collections. So for example, we have a project um, that we're studying some DNA from Old Dongola. Um, we have a study, we're studying DNA that's led by, that's Sudanese led um, from Kaderma. Um, we're studying some of the Marawitic sites. Um, and what's actually very important is working with people who are in Sudan and who are at university, for example, the University of Khartoum. Um, we've done some outreach there. We worked with some students. Um, that is gonna be very important because this is a big job and not one person can do that alone. Um, and also we learn so much more from working with people who live and have origins in the places that we, you know, we want to study. So building capacity for researchers is a very important part of that work. It's something that I hope to do a lot going forward. And of course, getting all the essential permissions and um, working with NCAM, making sure that everyone knows everything that we're doing, that we have full permission to do it, returning results. Things like that are going to be really important to you going forward. And arguably, I haven't had the chance to do that to the extent that I would have liked to do with this project. So, for example, this is why this talk is, is, is a great opportunity to talk about it. But I also hope to do that um, in Sudan on the grounds going forward to actually talk to people there um, and maybe, you know, help um, convey these results in Arabic and in a way that's more tangible to a broader number of people. So that's going to be super important um, working with students. I work with a lot of colleagues now who have been um, carrying out archaeological excavations in Sudan for a number of years and who have students from different universities on their digs working with them. And that's kind of a great way for me to um, give people some hands-on experience to working with skeletons or to talking about DNA. Um, the other part of that question was how do we deal with preservation? And it's really very difficult. Um, what is tends to happen when you push back to a further point in time in this Christian period, to say we're talking Meroitic or post-Meroitic periods, um, 
we're seeing a lot of samples that are totally devoid of DNA. So it's just not there. Um, and no magic, no technical success, no technical um, protocols can, can bring it back. Um, DNA degrades over time. It is negatively impacted by heat as the number one factor, but also just time. It breaks down. It's a biomolecule. It's not meant to live forever. Um, so we suffer a lot from that in Sudan, and that's why you haven't seen a lot of studies coming out like you have in maybe parts of Europe where there are thousands of genomes published now. Here in Africa right now, we're at about maybe 250 individuals with genome-wide data, ancient individuals, and we have more than that number at a single site at some places in Europe. So this is still a struggle, um, but it's kind of up to this new generation of, of researchers to continue to think about ways in which we might be able to improve the recovery of DNA from some of these assessments, because arguably this is the most fascinating place in the world to study. Um, just given what I said before about it having the greatest amount of genetic diversity, um, this is the place where, where we would love to learn the most about this past that we really truly don't yet understand. Mm, a question here also is that um, some researchers claim that this kind of research, like especially the Columnati project, you know, um, is part of the parachute science that, ha that takes place in Africa. Sure. So where no local authorities or, you know, no local researchers were involved. And uh, what would you say to defend, the, you know, such claims? And what are your plans to avoid such problems in the in the planned future work in Sudan? I think you 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 answered the, the second part in your in your last answer. But anyway, you can, sure. you can just emphasize on that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, when you inherit research that began in say the seventies before there was any sort of mm -hmm. um, desire to work with local groups. Yeah. You know, these, these, these samples were exported with permissions at that time, mm -hmm. um, and, and they're still in the US, which I don't know if that's actually the correct place for them mm -hmm. to be. Um, but, you know, I, I think when we're starting new projects, like what we hope to do now, we have a chance to involve people from the ground level. So, for example, on the Kaderma project that we're working on, I'm not the principal investigator on it. I'm just a supporting researcher. And our principal investigator is Sudanese. So I think that we have the chance now to start new projects that involve local students, all the way from elementary school to college level students, local researchers, and all of the appropriate authorities from the very beginning stage. Um, and that's really important. When you inherit a project that has already been carried out for almost 50 years when you get it, yeah. there's a chance that things just weren't, you know, the way you wish they were at the beginning. Now, I know we have all of the permissions to do this work. Um, the one caveat about this project was when the excavation was taking place, um, no uh, Islamic style burials could be touched whatsoever. There was a foreman mm -hmm. um, from what is now the NCAM on site to make sure that that was that was um, adhered to. So that was a very strict rule. Only Christian style burials could be um, excavated. And luckily, those were very easy to differentiate for this research team. Um, they also involved people from the communities that lived around the sites in actually the excavation process. They lived among them and they worked there during their field seasons. Mm -hmm. um, now that's not to say that everything was perfect, um, but going forward, we have a chance to do a lot better, including doing things like holding conferences in Africa where we can actually talk about these results, um, not just you know giving them to international audiences um, at conferences in Europe or the US, um, making results more accessible for people. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to make this open access so that no one would be behind a paywall to get this research. And then just making sure that you as a researcher are available to talk about it, answer questions about it, um, and provide the data if somebody would like it. So we're gonna keep improving. There's definitely room for improvement um, and it's a learning process, but um, you know, well, I think we'll keep on improving with this. I hope so at least.
Okay, thank you. I think that's clear. And, and, and I also wanted to highlight here that, you know, the change of politics, the change of missionaries work, the change of agreements between researchers and, you know, local government Sudan. What happened 50 years ago, I think is, I think has changed like, you know, three, not 360 degrees, but, you know, a little bit close to that. The yeah. people are becoming more aware about their own history. And I think in Sudan also we suffered for so long time that we didn't really appreciate our history, you know. Um, even I think the, the you know, uh, Jabal al Berkel and the uh, Meru permits, they had just came out like very soon. People, like many people in the whole world never heard about them, which, which you know, uh, which is really so sad to, to, to know about as well. Yeah, so um, I would like to ask people in the room if they have any questions, um, they could raise their hands if, if, if they want to, because we, we are just close to finish the, you know, the session here. So um, uh, I, I also hope that, you know, uh, this seminar remains as a communicable mean of, you know, of knowledge dissemination, uh, because I know, uh, you know, uh, your, your plans to, to reach out to, to people and to reach out, out to students and to ar archaeological researchers as well and, 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 you know, molecular biologists in Sudan. So, um, the, the, you know, this uh, meeting or this seminar has already been recorded and it's going to be... Um, Great. Uh, available on YouTube channel of the Sudanese Researchers Foundation, which is, I think, a great opportunity for people to, you know, uh, to watch it, to, you know, see part of their history, also get access to the data that thank you very much for also allowing that, you know, open access uh, publication, as well as, you know, uh, I would like to mention here as well in Arabic again, that Kendra samahad bi-istikhdam al-bayanat al tamma tahlila وموجودة على الصفحة بتاعت اللاب بتاع الدكتور ديفيد رايف ممكن ممكن أي زوج يدخل عليها ينزلها أو بنفس يعمل التحليل التحليل اللي هي عملته إذا عنده الرغبة أو يعمل أي حاجة وبتأكد إنه ممكن تقدم له حاجة أو تقدم من البحث حاجة يعني مفتوحة أفيلابل لكل زول بيقدر ينزلها. Yeah. Yeah, there there was a question in Arabic uh, asking about you know the population sample that uh, used in the in the study. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw in the README file for the data set that uh, uh, it's at 66 ancient individuals, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Uh, 66, uh, Abdullah. Abdullah yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. So, I think um, um, finally, I just I would like to conclude the, anec the anecdote of the medieval. Nubia by quoting the first page of the drowning novel. It's a Sudanese novel. Um, it's a very modern novel written by Hamur Ziada uh, because I just finished reading it. And actually I found like a kind of, you know, um, a relationship between the novel and the project of Kulubnarti. Hmm. So uh, it reflected what we have just learned from the ancient DNA study from Kulubnarti. And in the novel, it was like Hajar Narti. So the village name was Hajar Narti, which means the island of Hajar, I think, same, because there was a question also asking about the meaning of of Kulub Narti. Yeah. And it's Jazeera Kulub, island of Kulub, and here it's the Jazeera Hajar, I think simply. So uh, I also kind of uh, did an unofficial translation. So it's a very humble translation. I hope you, I'll just get to the, to the point. Um, and, and the events took place in two different time periods, the novel and, you know, the, the, the Kulub Narti um, events. But the same social stratification can just be ex excavated and examined and the secret relationships can be retrieved from the genome sequence of the, of the disease. So uh, I'll start here. The country looks as if it was created by coincidence without a clear plan inherently. And for an unknown love or an unknown ordeal, the sky granted her a river from heaven and named it the Nile. It runs from the upper south, uh, from, from the upper south down to the bottom of the north. On each side reach the greenery and the desert. Raiders, occupiers, conquerors, defeated, travelers, merchants, and armies entered, and no one knew where they went. A long time has passed. The people and their lives have changed, but the Nile hasn't. I mean, um, I just recommend reading it because to me, that was, you know, why there is a social stratification, um, even, you know, very recently in the 60s and 1960s. And even maybe why there were social stratifications, you know, thousand years ago, mm -hmm. like as, as it was in Kulubnati. 
So thank you so much, Kendra, for allowing us to be lively to the history of our, you know, ancestors. Uh, those who, you know, probably spoke a different language, practiced a different religion and culture, of course. And, and good luck with your ongoing projects and future research plans in Sudan and Northeast Africa as well. So thank you so much again. Thank, thank you, everyone, for being here. And goodbye. Ma'asalamu.